Hi, I'm Dr. John Martin with Ivy Family Health Updates. I'm here with my sister, Dr. Catherine Martin, my brother, Dr. Ed Martin, and our special guest today is Dr. Greg Lovis. Dr. Lovis is a board-certified plastic surgeon. He's got his undergraduate degree from Dartmouth College and a medical degree from the University of Minnesota. Following that, he did a fellowship in France and a uh, plastic surgery residency at the University of Miami. And Dr. Lovis is here today to talk to us about breast implants, both the safety issues and the cosmetic issues. And um, anyway, it's a great topic for her, and we're very happy to have Greg with us here today to tell us all about breast implants. Thanks, John. I've always enjoyed controversy. <laughs> um, what, there's a, a little story to tell in advance of talking about the implants, because I think just about everyone is aware uh, of an issue with the, the FDA over the past, actually it was 15 years. The history of breast, breast implants started in advance of the FDA having the power to regulate any device. The first implants were invented in 1962 and uh, they continued to be used over the years and evolved and lots of permutations and changes. The FDA uh, was given the power to regulate both drugs, which we hear about all the time, and devices in 1976 by the Congress. But there were so many devices already on the market, they couldn't monitor them all at once. And so it took until 1988 for the FDA to review breast implants and classify them as a, as a device that needed an evaluation or a clinical trial, which we hear about in all sorts of medicine. Well, the clinical trials started, and they you know, really weren't all that well done, and they had a review in 1991. Uh, one of the manufacturers, uh, the recommendation of the panel was to allow this one particular style to continue on the market while ongoing evaluation uh, was uh, gathered. But the commissioner, David Kessler, whose brother-in-law was a plaintiff's attorney, unilaterally overruled this and declared a moratorium, which lasted for 15 years. And it's a little unusual because they said they needed more data, but they did not approve a study for four more years, closing the door, until, not, until 2006, when the data just kept coming in, not so much from the, the limited studies, but from all over the world where the, especially the uh, Scandinavian countries have excellent records, and so the data would come in by the tens of thousands. And it basically absolved the implants for many of the sensational claims that were out there. So they were reintroduced in 2006, and they've gone on an evolution, just like computers have over the time. The original implants became actually softer and more liquid, and that was the year when they, there were probably more ruptures. They were just were not as substantial as the next generation, where the shells of these devices, they look pretty simple, but they're multi-layer, up to five layers on the outside, and to cut down the leakage, the strain, and so on and so forth. And now we are into the age of the gummy bear, which is uh, the number one implant in the world, which is from what's called a cohesive gel, meaning it maintains its shape as opposed to the older gels, which are more viscous, and they would kind of dissolve upon themselves. So this implant, if it has a rupture problem or a leakage problem, it, it stays there. It, it maintains its integrity. And uh, you know, I personally think that this is a sensational implant, and so does the rest of the world. It is still under clinical evaluation by the FDA, though. The uh, earlier implants have been approved and, and data is being gathered by the manufacturers when these implants are used. So the studies are ongoing at this time, uh, but they're uh, readily available for the public. And just to tell us a little bit, I know it was 15 years ago people said that there was an increased risk of the collagen vascular diseases and other things from these breast implants, but subsequently we found that that probably is not true. Is that that, that's correct. correct. You always need a reason to file a lawsuit. Okay. <laughs> so, but unfortunately when it came down to the facts, and these came out in, in journals like the New England Journal of Medicine and the National Board of Medical Review, we had, we gathered all the data from all over the place, and these were big, big, big numbers. And there was no difference. Okay. So, so women can now feel safe putting these silicone implants back in. Well, you know, the I mean, there's always a risk with any implant, but yeah. 
and when when we quote statistics, which I hate to do, you know, and if you, let's say you say, oh, there's a one percent incidence of this, that sounds great, unless you're the one percent. Right. And so nowadays, this is the the package for the year, the outer coating of the saline implants. Can you go over with us sort of the difference in the feel when they're in the patient and the saline implants, implants evolved uh, over the 15 years from the mortarium, so we have no other choice, and they've gotten a lot better. But they have a, a there's a distinct difference in the feel. Um, this is, this one's not filled because they, uh, they don't keep on the shelf that way. Um, the soft, softer, less viscous uh, implant also doesn't hold its shape quite as well. And I personally think that this one, the cohesive gel, feels most like youthful breast tissue. Okay. And what are you finding in, like, what's this, what size are these? Are these a normal implant size? Well, what, what I, need, I have here is... I know there's not a normal implant <laughs> size. <laughs> and there's, there's a huge range. Let's see, this is the, the lower profile, more uh, liquid implant. Okay. And this is called a higher profile. You see it sits up. Right. And it does that partially by itself, and it's partially by the shape of the envelope. Okay. And this one is a combination of the envelope and the, the gel on the inside. If we stripped off the envelope, it would still sit there. Still sit there. And how many cc's are these? Uh, these range, this ranges from a 300 cc inflatable to about 400 to 370, and that's about 350. So now that the silicone is back on the market, are any women choosing saline? So, no, the majority are still. There's, there's are they less, still worried? But no. Yet, yes, there are people who are still worried, but there's a, one other big difference. Cost. Oh. Now, before the moratorium, silicone gel implants, I think, were as low as $125 a piece or 250 for a pair. Now it's 1600 to 2000 yeah, Another question about the silicone implants. Um, are there any concerns in women who have them, concerns about breastfeeding? Well, that's been pretty well documented. It's very interesting. Um, they compared breastfeeding in non augmented patients with regular patients. There was no difference. But then they also tested um, uh, store milk, uh, milk. Mm -hmm. and that had about 80 times the silicone in, in it as, as the breast milk from a silicone patient. And then they used formula, which had about 800 times the silicone. <laughs> it's everywhere. Silicone is in beer. Uh -huh. now, when a woman gets to the point that she's going to have, start having mammograms, do the, do the uh, implants present uh, an issue? They're a, me they're, they're a mechanical issue, and it, again, it makes a difference whether they're placed under the muscle or over the muscle, because the mammography is not a terribly pleasant experience, and there's a lot of compression. And obviously, I'm going to look kind of silly here. But if I, if I have this on top of my breast, you know, it, it's going to be a little easier to compress with the breast tissue is wrapped around it. Mm -hmm. But if it's under the muscle, inside my shirt, you know, the breast tissue is out here, and you can do it a little better, but they still need to be able to compress it. They do not um, visualize as well, but the question then becomes, well, does it make a difference you know, in, mm -hmm. in your mammogram? What they did is they studied, again, a large cohort of uh, patients to see did it make a difference in what happened with them eventually. Mm -hmm. People who developed lesions and needed operations and had, you know, resection and reconstruction and so on. What they found at the end, it made no difference. Mm -hmm. But it is more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a fear of a lot of people was the rupture of the silicone implant. And these can still rupture, these newer models, correct? Yes. Uh, the, they have, all of the implants have a finite extent. Okay. You know, uh, nothing is forever, and that's one thing that's forgotten by both the patients and many of the physicians who are putting them in the patients. Um, it's kind of a failure to disclose. Okay. Yeah. There's the classic, I think the first device that we knew that was an implanted device that was popular was the total hip. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody remembers this. Mm -hmm. But the word on that was this is going to be your hip for the rest of your life. A few years later, they wore out. And what about age in terms of safety? I mean, it, we're here in Miami where teenage girls, I'm sure, are looking for breast augmentation. And we, can you do these safely in teenagers, or do you need to wait till they're done growing? Is there a 
Well, of course, growth is one thing in terms of that really it's, it's a, an informed consent issue as well. So, except for unusual circumstances, you, you have to be 18. You have to be an adult. Okay. To do this. Now, with deformities, uh, you know, a developmental, but uh, for deformities with parental consent, we can do that. Right. Any other questions? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Well, great. Thanks for being here. Pleasure. And uh, hopefully, you at home have learned a lot about breast implants, silicone implants, and we'll see you soon.